Hello friends, it's Steve. Uh, today I'm not in Southern Illinois. Um, Vivian and I are visiting fam family for the first time since COVID interrupted the world. Um, so uh, I'm sitting here in Virginia, <clears throat> shivering. There's a nice fireplace next to me, I'm trying to stay warm, okay? Uh, but yesterday it was in the 90s, so uh, who knows what tomorrow will be. In the process of traveling, I encountered a story with family, and I want to share that with you today. Katie Dunnigan um, was in the kitchen when her seven-year-old son, Bill, slammed through the screen door. He was crying, which immediately got her attention. Mm. What happened, Bill? She asked. He said, Mr. Burton called me a N-word and told me to go home. Katie didn't say a word. She just untied her apron, folded it, laid it across the, ta the uh, kitchen chair, grabbed her hat, took Bill by the arm and out the door they went. Now they didn't have far to go. Wimpy Burton's home was only a block south of theirs, just across the street. Um, <clears throat> Wimpy had been a standout athlete in high school, baseball, basketball, um, and he still was an avid fan. So avid in fact that he had built a full court basketball court in his backyard and organized the neighborhood youth to, uh, into teams to play. And Bill's older brother, James, was playing on one of those teams, which is how he ended up in the, on the sidelines. <clears throat> now, the Dunnigans came from Irish blood, black Irish with black hair. And in the summer, when um, Bill and Bill got a tan, his skin just turned a nice chocolate brown. Hence, Mr. Wimpy Burton's mistake. Except he didn't know it was a mistake, okay? Uh, arriving at the Burton residence, Katie marched directly into the backyard and directly onto the basketball court where the game was in full court press. Everything ground to a halt. <clears throat> Looking at her son, James, Jimmy, she said, Jimmy, take your brother and go home. One look at mom's eyes and Jimmy knew now was not the time to say, why mom? But before he had even reached the sidelines to take his brother home as instructed, Katie was marching up to Wimpy Burton. Now you have to understand, Katie stood about five foot five. She wasn't tiny, but she was far from tall. Wimpy Burton? Wimpy was named Wimpy because of his body shape. He was kind of pear-shaped like Wimpy in the Popeye uh, comic strips. And he was an affable, sociable person. And he stood about six, five, and he weighed over 300 pounds. But Katie Dunnigan marched straight up to him, right into his face, and lifted her finger and started shaking at it at him before she even opened her mouth. Wimpy Burton, what makes you think? And a string of profanity came out of her mouth that would have made a sailor blush. <clears throat> <sighs> and her voice just kept rising in volume and pitch until the entire neighborhood could hear her the words of her final words of her first sentence call my son a n word now wimpy burden didn't know what to think about this okay he was totally caught off guard, and he didn't have a clue what Mrs. Dunnigan, as she was referred to now, um, 
<clears throat> was talking about. He backed up trying to de-escalate the situation and get them some space, but she followed right after him, still screaming at the top of her lungs, shaking her finger in his face. Mm -hmm. he, he, he looked around for some support, but everybody else was kind of slack-jawed and as shocked as he was. And before it was over, mm -hmm. Wimpy Burton was backed up onto his own back porch, trapped between the door that he couldn't get open and Katie Dunnigan screaming at him in front of him. Jimmy and Bill were still there. They never made it off the basketball court and the scene was indelibly etched into their memories. <clears throat> so much so that today it's still a byword in the family. If somebody starts to cross the line and you're starting to, you know, now don't make me go all wimpy Burton on you. The title of this week's Bible study was A Second Chance on Life. And the topic deals with sin and salvation and forgiveness. Now usually this conversation focuses on the eternal consequences of sin and the need of for getting saved. And when you understand the cosmology of most Christians, that at the end of life, we face a dividing point. And most, some of us end up in a better place. But most of us don't. You can understand why this is a priority for Christians. But I want to focus on a real world application that's more immediate. How do we mend relationships now? You know, cultures and philosophers have struggled with this through the centuries. Aristotle and the early Stoics didn't consider being forgiven to being forgiving to be a virtue. In fact, Aristotle could only think of two situations where forgiveness was even permissible, even ethical. Uh, that was when co coercion was involved or when incapacity was involved. Today, when we hear of people being declared not competent to stand trial, that's a reflection of the conclusion of Aristotle that some people simply can't be judged because they don't have the capacity for ethical reasoning. And when we try military officers or politicians for war crimes that were committed by the soldiers that they commanded, we're also putting into practice Aristotle's conditions. Let me just mute this. <clears throat> but does that mend relationships? Now the later Stoics promoted a form of forgiveness that they called clemency. Now this was only available if you were powerful, a ruler, uh, and it usually played out uh, in the setting of warfare when, when a ruler conquered his enemies, clemency meant not killing them. Now that didn't mean they got off scot-free, he didn't welcome them with open arms, but he extended some mercy. He only drug them through the streets in humiliation rather than uh, killing them and their families and everybody associated with them. Does that mend relationships? Our political systems today almost demand a clemency. but we don't see healed relationships after a hard-fought political battle. 
the Romans, uh, Roman law offered three pathways towards forgiveness, if we can call it that, uh, for resolving conflict. One was penance, doing something good to offset the bad. In our legal system today, we hear of people being sentenced to 100 hours of community service. That's penance. <clears throat> and in our personal relationships, have you ever tried to make amends by doing something good? Okay. Men, have you ever bought your wife flowers or candy when you know, knew that something you had done needed, made, put you in need of forgiveness? Some religions actually systematize penance uh, as a part of divine forgiveness. The, the other, another pathway in Roman law was punishment. 40 lashes could resolve minor uh, infractions, uh, but from there, depending on how severe it was, it went, the, the penalty went up. In our legal system today, we use fines and incarcerations, and in some places, the death sentence uh, as punishment. And at a personal level, while spanking children may be out of favor in Western culture, we still have very sophisticated and painful ways of punishing each other that sometimes are more damaging than physical violence would be. A pardon calls for canceling the penalty and in some cases, even the judgment of guilt. But it's always outside the legal system. It comes from a, a, another party who has the power to overturn our conviction. Presidents, governors are the examples in the American system. But again, the question is, does this restore relationships? The touchstone that I find in the lives of men and women in the Bible is forgiveness. But it goes far beyond the forgiveness that was envisioned by philosophers or Roman culture. First of all, God is always involved. Remember the earlier touchstone of God as our Father? Whatever we do reflects on our Father. He holds himself responsible for our behavior. And so in the Bible, when a person sins, they sin against God first and man second. And so for, that reframes forgiveness as needing to come from God as well as from men. In the Old Testament, that came in the form of the sacrificial system, offering sacrifices. If you sinned, if you were judged guilty of something, you had to go to the tabernacle, to the temple, lay your hands on an animal's head, and confess your sin, and then kill the animal, and the animal was burned, in doing so, you are confessing two things. One, your need for forgiveness. And two, the cost of forgiveness. Because forgiveness always carries with it a cost. Either the person forgiving has to suffer the injustice that was done, or the person who committed the injustice has to suffer punishment. And punishment usually inflicts more injustice. When we incarcerate a father, we are depriving, depriving his children of his parenting. 
depriving his wife of his support. Now you say, well, do we say they deserve that? No, we don't think about it. All we think about is justice within the narrow confines of the victim and the legal system. We don't think of the injustice, the pain and suffering that is incurred when we inflict that punishment. Forgiveness always requires sacrifice. Someone has to suffer the consequences. A third pathway, though, is for a mediator to step in and suffer for both par parties. And that's where Jesus, the bridge that we talked about last week, comes into play in this touchstone. As God, he chooses to offer clemency to those who repent, turn away from their sin. He does not avenge our insults and disrespect. In essence, God suffers for us. He chooses to accept the insults and the disrespect that we, as his children, extend towards him. But as a man, Jesus chose to suffer injustice and punishment himself. So he became both the divine victim and the human victim. And his sacrifice has power in our lives if we will accept it. But that's all conditional on us accepting the touchstone of there being a God, of him being our father, of Jesus being the bridge. But in the Old Testament, the sacrifices were not the end of seeking forgiveness. You also had to seek forgiveness from humans. And this usually took the form of a prescribed restitution, payment. If it was an animal, you had to replace it. If there was, if there was harm done, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Talk about restitution. If I poke your eye out, my eye gets poked out. In the New Testament, we have similar examples. Okay, um, the most um, the most clear uh, is the case of Philemon and Onesimus. Uh, Philemon was a slave owner. Onesimus was his slave who ran away and met Paul. Years later, in Rome, Paul was a prisoner, but through Paul, Onesimus became a Christian. And the book of Philemon in the Bible is Paul's letter back to Philemon, the slave owner, who was also a Christian, who had become a Christian through Paul's ministry, asking him to accept Onesimus back without punishment, without penance, because he was a fellow Christian. But what was asked of Onesimus? Onesimus was asked to go back and be a faithful slave. I can't imagine that situation. The Bible defines sin in two ways. It defines it as behavior. In 1 John 3, 4, sin is the breaking of the law. But it also signs, defines it as a broken relationship. Whatever is not of faith, of trust, is sin. And I find that dual definition is beneficial if I keep it in mind. When I break the speed limit, I'm not just breaking a rule. I'm showing disrespect for the community that put that rule into place. And I'm showing disregard for the people whose lives 
may be endangered because I break the, the rule. This dual definition moves sin from being an abstract religious concept for me into something that connects with my day-to-day -day life. But it also changes the basis of forgiveness. Paying a penalty can resolve legal difficulties, but it does nothing for relationships. Doing penance, making amends, eating humble pie. What does it take to mend a relationship that's been broken? Christians talk, often talk about repentance as being all that's necessary for forgiveness. But I've seen too many people who felt very sorry for what they had done, but were nowhere close to experiencing forgiveness. A young man comes to mind who's reckless driving. He was racing some, some fellows when he came over a hill at over 120 miles an hour and killed one of the doctors that I work with. He asked to meet with someone who knew the doctor and he just kept repeating over and over again, I never intended for this to happen. I never intended for this to happen. Where can he find forgiveness? Okay, Steve, you're getting a little repetitious here, okay? No one likes to think about forgiveness this much. When we need forgiveness, we want it mom and dad style, okay? When my brother and I would have a fight, uh, mom would sit us down and scold us for a brief period of time, and then she would say, okay, hug and make up. And we would dutifully hug and make up. My dad was a little more formal. Shake hands and make up was his mantra, okay? But as I grew older, I found out that in many situations that didn't mend the relationships. So I resorted to some of the, the, the methods that I described here before. Uh, uh, whether I, I, sometimes I struggle with whether I deserve to be forgiven just like Aristotle did. Like the Romans, I've assigned myself penance many times to try and make up for what I had done. Or I sought outright punishment. What do I have to do? But it was only as I began to accept Jesus' ministry for me, what Jesus has done and is doing for me, that I began to find healing. I do not have to write all the injustices done to me in order to experience peace. There are many messes in my life that no matter how hard I try, I will never be able to clean up. The Bible asserts that love, grace, Christ's sacrifice, covers a multitude of sins. And I found that true in my life. I challenge you today. Will you test this touchstone on your spiritual life? I think you'll find it beneficial. Have a good week, my friends. Be safe. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I'll see you next week.